Yeah. All right. So let's build some speed. Yeah, let's get ourselves going up here. Hey guys, what is up? John here from FlyAtMikeAlpha.com, and today I'm gonna be talking about something a little bit different. Uh, nobody really likes to, you know, talk about the mistakes they make in flying. We're all perfect pilots, right? Uh, no one really wants to admit fault when they do something wrong, especially on camera, on YouTube, to the entire world. Um, but admitting your mistakes, talking about mistakes, sharing them with others is a really important part of learning. And hopefully you guys can learn from one of my mistakes, one of my many. I make plenty of mistakes to sit here and say anything else would be a total lie. Um, when I fly airplanes, I make mistakes sometimes. A lot of times. Um, usually they're pretty, pretty minor. Uh, you know, you forget carburetor heat. You use two swipes of trim instead of three. Whatever it might be. Little tiny things, minor details, not that big a deal. This one was a little bit more of a big deal, could have led to something kind of bad, and that's why we're going to be talking about it today. So we'll walk you through the thought process, the events and things leading up to it, what you know was going on, why things went the way they were, a number of things went wrong, any of those little bits of the chain, any of those links in the chain could have been broken, could have stopped the bigger event, um, and then we'll talk about you know a simple way to sum it up all at the end. In the meantime, try not to judge me too much here. You know, I mean, come on, we're all human, right? All right, so a little bit of backstory here. So we were up at Don Lee's place in Talkeetna, Alaska, filming for the float plane course, the seaplane pilot course, online at flyatmikehealth.com. Awesome course, by the way, beautiful scenery, amazing place to fly, really cool stuff. That course is live now on the site if you're interested in becoming a seaplane pilot. Lots of great safety-oriented videos in there of great ways to remain safe and things to do. This is a video about what not to do. Um, but either way, so we're up there in Talkeetna. I'm flying with another CFI, very experienced guy, lots of float time. I had a little bit of water time under my belt, um, you know, obviously a CFI as well, but really only about an hour or two in this physical airplane. So we kind of agreed, hey man, you're PIC, you know the airplane, you know the limits of it. If you say, you know, go, don't go, this, that, whatever, I'm going to defer to you, you know what's going on with this thing. I'm pretty new to it. Um, so, you know, I'm totally going to defer to you on all these things. Um, also, you know, we're up there filming, making these videos. When we're doing that, I'm really not necessarily focused 100% on the flying like I necessarily should be. I'm focused heavily on, is the GoPro camera recording? Is the audio level right? Is everything dialed up correctly? Are we all synced up? Are we good to go? Awesome. That's my focus. It takes a lot of energy and mental brain power to run all those cameras. So we decide, you know, it's kind of late in the day. The airplane was in for maintenance. We're in a rush. Try to get back out in the water. Try to get some flying in for the day. Don't know why we were in such a rush. You know, sunset's like 11, 15 p.m. in May in Talkeetna. Um, we had plenty of daylight, but I think we were both just tired, you know, and wanted to kind of get in the airplane, get out there, do some filming, do some water work, get the videos, the shots we needed for the course, and then get back. So a little bit of a rush. Things had kind of calmed down. It was a warm May day, um, you know, getting into uh, late May there, mid-May. Really warmed up, 70-some degrees, pretty warm for Talkeetna, and really no wind. Um, obviously, it was pretty clear to us that, yeah, the water's very glassy. It's very smooth out here. There's no wind. It's calm. But for whatever reason, that didn't totally process. So let's take a quick little look here as we taxi out. You guys can kind of get a feel for the dynamic in the cockpit of what's going on here. A little run up. Yep, sounds good. See if those P leads actually hold, even if they don't. Yep, they appear to be working. That appears to be working. That appears to be working. Perfect. Oil pressure and temperature look happy as a clam. We got controls, instruments. Instruments were set 400, slight in, slightly above. Level on the VSI. Attitudes up and stable. Boom, guests on both. And we're full tanks on almost both. Left. Attitude run up is complete and area looks clear. So we're chit chatting a little bit. We're kind of half heartedly doing some checklists, some mnemonic devices by memory, not using paper checklists in that particular airplane, just doing everything by memory using a mnemonic checklist to work through everything. I'm trying to kind of do it. He's kind of helped me out. It's not really clear who's really totally in charge. It's just kind of, you know, two guys flying together. Well, that's the thing kind of going wrong right there. It's not a very professional organized cockpit, but hey, you know, I'm focused on cameras. He's focused on, you know, helping me get the shots I need. 
it's it is what it is right we are both taxing out on this super smooth glassy water but we're in this mindset of we need to go out and get glassy water shots we need to get you know rough water takeoffs we need to get you know crosswind takeoffs blah blah we need some shots not we need to actually fly the airplane for the conditions that are at hand can be really easy when you're in a training environment and you're doing X, Y, and Z to forget that actually you need to do F right now because that's what the conditions are calling for, but you're so used to just deciding you want to do a short field takeoff, a soft field takeoff, but maybe the conditions aren't such that allow for it because you're just so used to just doing whatever you want for training purposes. That happens to me. I think that happened to uh, the CFI I was flying with as well. We just weren't really in the right mindset, and so we're just doing a normal takeoff using a normal amount of lake, and the one critical thing here is not choosing an abort point. We just decided, hey, we're doing a normal takeoff. The airplane flew earlier today. It should fly again, right? Same fuel load, same people, whatever. Winds roughly the same-ish, only a few not different, but it's glassy water, and that airplane sticks to that water so well, and there's a ton of drag. So... If nothing else, we should have chosen an abort point that if the airplane wasn't off by then, we would have aborted. But instead, no, we decide, hey, it's time to go. So we'll kind of take a look at that here. We're recording. Looking good. And so basically as we come around here, I'm going to kick it around to the left, two thirds through the turn. Water rudders are coming up. Power's coming in. The flaps are going to be set to one notch, 15 degrees. Make sure it's set, car beat set, and the throttle will be coming in here in a second. Okay. Sounds good. I've got good rudder control on my side. Doors shut. Oh, and I tighten up my shoulder harness way too much to reach the water rudders. Yep. That's uh, so the main thing you always want to check for. Always run these guys super loose. All right. All right. Now, keep report information. Lima, time 0301. Zulu, wind 160 at 6. Okay. Hey, Rock. Power's coming in. Yeah. All right. So we're motoring right along. We're cruising down the lake. And yeah, about this time, I'm like, oh, wait, the water is kind of glassy. We should probably try to break this thing off. Let me throw in some little ale around here, try to roll a float off, whatever. A very half-hearted glassy water takeoff attempt. Doing anything half-hearted or anything half-committed in an airplane, terrible idea. Really terrible idea. You know the difference between the squirrel you see on the side of the road that runs across and gets to the other side versus the squirrel that's dead in the middle of the road? The one in the middle of the road, he was partially committed. The other one was fully committed. You can do dumb things like run across the road in front of a moving car if you're fully committed to it. If you're partially committed and you stop halfway, gonna be a bad day. Just ask the squirrel. This was another one of those scenarios. Kind of a half-hearted, partially committed, oh, you know, we're on the water longer than we should be. That'd be a great time to abort. But no, instead, let me go ahead and work this airplane off. Really waiting, you know, because I'm starting to wonder now. I'm not really even sure, man, those trees are coming. Maybe we should just stay on the water. Maybe I should abort. But I'm waiting for somebody to tell me that. I'm waiting for the guy that's way more experienced next to me to say something. You know, and I'm just like, I'm not real comfortable with it. I'm not real sure. And if you're unsure, well, here's a novel idea. You're not sure the airplane's going to fly and clear the trees. Well, maybe you could just reduce the power, retard the throttle, close it, stay on the water, come back to a displacement taxi. And he could have said, hey, why'd you do that? And you'd say, oh, I didn't think we were going to clear the trees. And he'd be like, no, you totally were going to clear the trees. What are you talking about? And you'd be like, oh, sorry, my B. Um, yeah, I just wasn't quite comfortable with it. Let's go ahead and taxi back and try it again. If you say that was fine, we'll do it again and it'll be fine. That would be okay. Rather than just waiting for the other guy to say something. And he eventually did kind of late, right? As I broke the floats off the water. And now we're pretty committed to it. So if you're unsure, uncertain, uncomfortable, great time to just stop. And maybe, you know, oh, you're not sure about the airplane clearing the trees, but you know, you're not sure that maybe it will clear the trees and you don't want to seem inexperienced or you don't want to, you know, inconvenience everybody. And now we got to step taxi back to the other end of the lake. Maybe now we don't have enough fuel for what we plan. We have to go back and get fuel. Now we're going to take more time. It's going to be a few more ticks on the Hobbs meter. It's way cheaper, a few more ticks on the Hobbs meter than, you know, crashing the airplane. Um, crashes are really expensive, both in the airplane and the damage to your own body. Um, so would have been a great idea to just 
you know, close the throttle, stay on the water and say, hey, we're not going to go today, even though, you know, I was waiting for him to say something he didn't. So that's really on me. As any pilot, you have common sense. Think, you know, it's a little bit of inconvenience, maybe a little bit of embarrassment or something because it was going to work anyways. But, you know, make the safe choice if you can. You can always talk about it later. No harm, no foul. That's about being a good, mature, you know, having emotional maturity and, you know, confidence in your own piloting ability to make those decisions that are safe, might error and might be inconvenient, but no matter what, are going to be safe. So we bypassed the whole safe option of aborting the takeoff when we probably should have, and we totally should have chosen that abort point to be way further back. Let's go ahead and see how the rest of this played out. Yeah. All right. So let's build some speed. Cool. Yep, we're gonna want some speed here. Okay, let's go up. All right. Yeah, let's get ourselves going up here. We didn't use that much of the lake, but yeah. Woo! That was most of it. So we finally got the airplane off the water. Now, you know, emotionally, you know, what you want to do is pull back and climb away, but you can't. You just broke off the water. You're pretty slow. You need speed. You need to keep that thing in ground effect, preferably, you know, a few feet off the water, a foot, two, three feet low to the water in ground effect. Ground effect is magnified the closer you are. So you will accelerate quicker. So now you got trees, you got you and you want to do this, but if you try to do that, you'll probably just mush and hit the trees. Now you got to build speed and then climb away at VX, rotate out of ground effect at VX at the right time. Now, what happens if you rotate VX and you're still not going to clear the trees? Well, luckily we're at flaps 15 for the takeoff. We still had flaps here and that's why this wasn't that big a deal. It's a big deal. It was uncomfortable for both of us. We both felt uncomfortable and you should not be feeling uncomfortable in airplanes. Otherwise you should be doing something a little different. So we did clear the trees, flaps 15 at VX, but had we not been able to, we could have flapped our way over them. Now, when you pull 15 to 30 flap and you flap the airplane over, it's gonna gain some altitude, it's gonna bleed some speed. And luckily we know that, yes, there's descending terrain on the backside of those trees. Had it been continuously rising terrain, pulling more flaps would have been pointless. It's not gonna continuously you know, make you climb forever. It's just going to give you that initial boost and then you're gonna be pretty low on speed and you're gonna to need to lower that nose and trade some altitude for airspeed. Could have done that in this scenario. Luckily, we didn't have to. So we had some uh, some tricks up our sleeve still. We were able to build that speed and ground effect. We we're able to climb away at VX, clear the trees. We had flaps as an additional option if we needed them. Either way, it was uncomfortable. What could we have done different? Any number of things. We could have been a little more present. We could have briefed stuff on the dock, looked around. Hey, what are the conditions? Which way do we want to go? We could have paid a little bit more attention to the ATIS or the AWAS when we were listening on Taxi Out. We could have followed checklists a little bit more rigorously. We could have discussed things a little more clear. We could have, you know, I could have aborted, you know, myself since I was at the controls. Uh, you know, the other CFI, he could have reduced the power or sent abort sooner. Most important thing, there's any number of things, right? Could have been not so distracted with cameras, could have had a better plan, could have done any number of things. It's so complicated and flying is already complicated and there's a number of things that went wrong here. So rather than trying to fix the number of things that went wrong, because inevitably I'll probably make those same mistakes again, being overly focused on cameras, being in a rush to get out there, being tired, being in a rush to you know get out there, get the airplane in the air and get some shots that we need. You may fall into those same traps. You'll probably make the same mistakes. So instead of trying to fix all our mistakes, which is pretty much a pointless effort, you can try. You know, you could use a 275 step checklist. The attorneys will still say it should have been 276 steps when you wind up in court over it, when something does go wrong. Instead, let's just come up with a nice simple solution here for a stopgap measure, right? If everything else got messed up, if we made all those mistakes, not checking the temperature, the density altitude, the glassy water, the takeoff roll, checking our performance charts, doing all those calculations with the whiz wheel, all that stuff. If we didn't do any of that, all we really had to do here was choose an abort point for a couple of reasons, right? Choose an abort point where not only you'll be off by, and then you can clear tr the obstacles, clear terrain safely. So choose an abort point that will give you terrain clearance and obstacle clearance. That's one key thing. Also choose the abort point where the airplane should be off by. So if it's not off by there, maybe there's something else wrong. You could be checking static RPM. Maybe you're not making full power. Maybe you're running on one mag. Maybe you have the carburetor heat on. Maybe, 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 maybe again, all really complicated things. Maybe you missed one thing on that 275 step checklist on your before takeoff checklist, whatever it was. Doesn't matter. Choose the abort point. If the airplane's not off by then, when it should be, not a safe abort point, you know, you could say the airplane should be off in a thousand feet. 
if we get off in 2,000 feet, it'll still be safe, we'll clear terrain. But if you get off in 2,000 feet, maybe it wasn't making full power on the takeoff run. Maybe you should just stay on the ground then. Choose a board point where the airplane should be off by and will also guarantee you terrain clearance, obstacle clearance. And if you're not off by then, cut the throttle, come back to a displacement taxi. Whether you're on wheels or floats or whatever you're on, this applies to all airplanes, guys. Choose the abort point, stick to it. There is always an abort point for a landing. So you can go around before you, it gets too late and you're going to hit obstacles. There is always an abort point on takeoff. If you are getting into an airplane and landing or taking off without an abort point that you have verbally announced and consciously agreed on with yourself, with other people in the airplane, then just stop because it's not... It's just not safe. There's any number of things you could have made a mistake of, and you could have used the I'm safe checklist, pave, decide, all those different things. Too much stuff out there. Too complicated. Too many things that you could possibly miss one of them. Instead, stick to the abort point. Now, this is my opinion. It may not help you in all scenarios. You know, maybe you'll still wreck an airplane. Probably not, though. If you stick to abort points every single time, one simple, easy, foolproof method, in my opinion anyways, that if the airplane will get off by that point, then everything else should be okay. So that's the takeaway from this video. Abort points. Stick to them. All those other things, hopefully you'll take away. You won't be distracted by cameras, by your cell phone. You won't be in a rush. You'll use performance charts. You'll make all those calculations. You'll observe the local environment before you start up the engine, start taxing out and all those things. But you'll probably miss one or more of those things sometime in your flying career. I miss them all the time. It's just reality here, guys. So use stopgap measures that are foolproof or as foolproof as possible safe, consistent, do it consistently, abort points. They really help. Hopefully you guys learned from my mistake here. Not the end of the world, not the best, kind of a little embarrassing. Try not to judge me too much in those comments below, all you keyboard warriors in your mom's basement. But, you know, either way, we did get some great footage, super pretty, and if you guys are interested in that seaplane course, it's online at flyatmikealf.com, along with all of our other courses on there, where we teach you good safe habits. Uh, and hopefully you can learn from this video of some things not to do and some things to do like using abort points. Either way, guys, thank you so much for watching. Check out flyatmikealpha.com. And if you can't fly every day, then flyatmikealpha.com. We'll see you guys in the next one.